Jason Elquist, one of the regional instructors for the NWFA. And uh, today we're going to go over pattern layout and uh, making a jig for a pattern floor. What do we do every day? We talk about preparing the wood for the house, right? So before we ever get to this point, we need to do a lot of stuff ahead of time. Okay, so this is the fun stuff that we get to do in the shop, either ahead of time or during the project. But there's a lot to do before we ever get there. Okay, we still need to do all our moisture testing for our substrate, our environmental testing, so we make sure that when we build this beautiful floor, that it works, right? Okay, how many of you guys have done the traditional three, four, five to find your uh, center layout? Yeah, everybody? Anybody ever use tremble points? Okay, a few of you guys? Good. Welcome to tremble points. These will become a great friend of yours in the layout, okay? You can find perfect 90s with these in large rooms, so these tremble points can be extended out. There's a few things they have to be careful with. The distance from here to here, once you start making a measurement, cannot change. Okay, we can change them after we mark a point to different lengths, okay, and I'll go over that. But it's very particular that we need to keep these the same distance apart. Now, if we need to stop in the middle and sharpen our pencil, okay, we pull this out, we sharpen it, our mark's still good. Possibly, but if we're making new marks when we're right in the middle of the process, we need to start over because the two distances have now changed. Okay, so for purposes here, we're going to pretend that I've snapped a line down the center of the floor and we're going to find two, two different quadrants. We're going to divide this into a 90, two 90s first from a 180. Then in the left quadrant, we're going to find a 45 degree angle. And in the right quadrant, your left, is going to be a 30, 60, 90 triangle which is what we would need to use for a rhombus pattern. Okay, and then I'm going to show you how to make the jig for it. So we're going to pretend this is the center of our room, and we've measured and we found the center point. Equal distance from either side, okay? We're going to take our tremble points, set them to um, whatever distance we want. This distance won't change between the two marks. Okay, so I'm going to take and put this on the center point. And I'm going to make a mark here, and then I'm going to make a mark here. Now I can change my distance. So these are set points that I want to make sure I keep, okay? Now I can change my distance. Now I'm going to work off of these new points. I'm going to go to that intersection and make a mark, and to this intersection and make another mark. Now if I use a straight edge or a chalk line and I draw a straight line between this point and here, and I'm going to use a Sharpie so everybody can see it better, okay? Normally you'd use as fine a marker as you can or a chalk line maybe that has a braided fishing line. 100 pound braided fishing line tends to be about the right thickness, okay? It's some of the 50 and 30, it's just too fine, it doesn't hold enough chalk. Okay, so that is a 90 degree angle on both sides, here and here. Okay, and we didn't have to do any of the fancy measuring, the three, four, five, and the increments of that, right? Sometimes when we're using a tape measure and you're measuring 15 feet out in one direction and then 20 feet across, if there's a bend in your tape measure, it's now not as accurate, right? Okay, so this is one of the most accurate ways to come up with that. Now we want to come up with our 45 degree angle. Okay, so I'm going to shorten this one up a bit. Sometimes this can get a little bit complicated when you start getting a lot of marks on a floor. So what I'm going to do is put a circle around these so I know which ones they are. Okay, because I don't want to get them confused with my other mark. Now I'm going to use those two to change my measurement again. Now I'm going to lengthen these out a little bit, not a lot. I want to have a pretty crisp angle where these meet. And if you extend this out too much, you'll get an angle that's very, very shallow. Okay, and it's hard to see the center of a shallow angle. It's easier to see the center of an angle that's like this, right? So I'm going to go off of both of those points and make another radius.
Now when I draw a line through here, I've just broken this down into a 245s. 45 here, 45 here. Okay, and we can continue to break this down. So if we're making a starburst or a medallion, you can continue to break this down. 22 and a half, 11 and a quarter, and so on and so forth, all the way down. So you wanna see how that's broken down real quick and then I'll jump to the other side? Yes, okay. So again, we start over again. When I'm doing this, a lot of times if I know I'm breaking this down, and I'm gonna do it for this. I'll actually make a full arc on the board because this number won't change anymore. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll do a full, full radius. Because this, I can work off of every single one of these now. Because this is equal distance from here and here. So when I divide this quadrant into a 22 and a half, I still have this common distance, right? It's the same distance from the end. So now I can shorten these up a bit so I get a nice crisp line. And that's what I was talking about before. You don't want to have that shallow little line. And now I will work off of this and this. And those are a 22 and a half. All right, let's totally confuse you. So the other one we're going to do for this rhombus, rhombus pattern is a 30, 60, 90. Okay, we have a fixed angle of a 90. So we have our A and B legs and our C leg. Let's see if I can draw this upside down. Our hypotenuse. So this is a unit of one. This is a unit of two. And this is a unit of square root of three. Does everybody understand that? So we can do this with the tremolo points. And we don't do have to do any math. So we need to find our unit of one and then a unit of two. We're going to start over here. I'm going to make these a little smaller. Here's my unit of one. Okay. Here's my unit of two. Okay. Now, if I set this up properly, so now I want to find the 90 degree angle here. Okay, which is gonna break this down into a 30 degree angle for our layout. So I can work off of these two units. Okay, and that's gonna give me my 90. So I've just replicated my 90 degree line Okay, so I've just transferred a 90 degree line, and now I'm gonna use the unit of two to find my, where that intersection is, is going to be my 30 degree angle. That was almost right there. So that's now a 30 degree angle. This is a 60 degree angle. Okay, if we want to break that down into an additional 60 degree or 30 degree angle, we do the same thing we did over here. Okay, with our common distance from the center point, right? Which would be something like this. Make sense? So we would use this on a pattern floor. Sorry guys. Something like a rhombus pattern. Okay, where those lines will line up on this 30 degree. Through the center here, through the center here. So you would snap those lines so that you made sure 
increments of this, whatever that number is, 12 inches or so, um, you can continue to snap those lines so you can make sure your pattern stays consistent across that floor. Make sense? So a rhombus pattern is pretty easy. This is the same exact piece, cut over and over and over and over and over again. So we can do this on a chop saw. This is a pretty mild angle, so it's a 30 degree angle. We can do it there, or we can do it on a table saw. Many times when we're doing something like this, the repetitive nature of it, that's when we have problems with what? Cutting off digits, okay? It's very important when I'm running guys, running these floors in my shop, that I rotate guys off of a saw. I'm gonna rotate him through where he needs to take a break. Okay, the monotony of running these pieces through, you will cut your finger or your hand, and it can be bad. So essentially what we do is we use the guides here on the table saw and we put rails on the bottom of a sled. Pretty simple, right? Okay, just cut out a piece of wood, plywood, the size of that I want my sled to be. If I were doing multiple pieces like this, my sled might be a little larger. And you can make these as big and as elaborate as you might want. Okay, if this is a jig that I'm gonna make for a rhombus pattern that I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna make this thing really nice. I'm gonna make it out of some architectural grade plywood, something that's gonna hold up. I may even use on the wearable pieces, something like these, where they're running against metal all the time, very hard wood. Okay, I would also put maybe a little bit of wax on these so that it slides a little easier on the table. Okay, so basically I put my plywood on there and I've already cut my rails to where they'll fit in the grooves on this table saw. Can everybody see the grooves on the table saw? Everybody understand that? Okay, now we've come up with a 30 degree angle, okay, that we set our block against. Okay, we put a stop. Same thing as you would on a, on a chop saw or a miter saw. Okay, that piece fits perfectly right there. So this is set at a 90 or 30 degree angle to my blade. Okay, the other thing you need to do before this is make sure that your, your blade is true to your saw. Okay, this one's off just a little bit, but we didn't have an Allen wrench. So you wanna make sure you true that up, okay? So this piece is gonna be the piece that I'm gonna use and repeat and repeat and repeat, okay? So since this one's gonna be glued down, I didn't, we don't have a, a, uh, anything to put an edge on this one, I went ahead and cut the tongue and groove or the tongue portion off. Okay, so I've got these clamps on here. Okay, this is gonna hold the piece in place. And as it moves across, I'm going to clamp both sides. This will allow me to be able to move this sled back and forth on the saw without fear of this piece flying off. Okay, it is bound on this left side. If I try and pull it back and that piece twists a little bit, it's gonna fly up in your face. Okay, so these little vices, these little clamps are, are cheap and they're really, really handy. The other thing, I don't have to hold this piece in place. Okay, I don't have my hands up here close to anything. Okay, sometimes you can't see that blade coming up through here. And if I'm running this thing for four hours, now I've just totally forgotten and I run my hand all the way through it. Okay, the other safety thing you can put is a stop on both the front and the back. Okay, a little piece that would sit down here and hit on the back of the saw or on the front, which wouldn't allow me to push this thing any further. Okay, it would stop. Okay, the ones that I build at my shop, as I pull them back, it'll actually have a lip here and it'll hang over. Okay, so that as I'm pushing here, it'll come back and stop. And as I'm pushing on the front, it doesn't allow it to lift up. Okay, so that would be something I would build on a jig that I'm gonna keep. So again, when you're setting this up, once you have it set up, you want to adjust your saw to the proper height, which is how high? Like this? Is that how I want to do it? Just like that, just above the height of the wood. Okay, if you do cut your finger with it that set at that height, it's only going to cut it. Okay, it's not going to cut it off. We don't want to cut anything off of ourselves. So I'm going to put this piece to start with. I've got a square edge. Okay, I want to make that a 30 degree angle. So I'm going to lock this in place on the one side, start my saw, 
And from here, I shouldn't have to really turn my saw off unless I'm walking away from it to stack material. You don't want to leave the saw running in the shop. Okay, somebody can fall on it. So at this point now, I don't need to hold this piece. It's held in place. So now I can hold it on the back and the handle here where it's safe. So you guys get the idea, this, can be, this piece can be repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated. Okay, when you look at most of your patterns, and I sent away for, I looked online the other day, and I looked up geometric patterns, and when I looked it up, I got these adult coloring books. Apparently they're good for stress. Okay, so I haven't started using mine yet, but it's got tons of patterns in here. Okay, this one's like four or five bucks. When you start looking at some of these, and you look, for instance, this one, there are two repeating pieces in there. That's it. So you can make a jig pretty simply and turn a floor and turn out some pretty neat stuff. You can throw some different species in the little squares. Okay, and this is stuff you can do with scrap material. Maybe you had a couple hundred feet sitting around. Don't let it just sit there. Make it into something. You can turn it into a, uh, an entry piece. Okay. The only other thing I'm going to talk to you here about is the little things on this sled. And you guys can come up afterwards and I can talk to you about it if you want. I know we're running short on time. Some of the little things that are on this to help keep dust from building up, which it will. Okay, if I make 600 of these pieces today, there's eventually going to be dust build up. Okay, so what I put is a little relief on the back of all of these. Okay, so that I can, when I put this piece up against there, it's got a little place for it either to push the dust into or that dust to blow out when you turn the saw on. Okay, periodically walk over to all of your stuff and blow it all off. Okay, dust collection systems in a shop are phenomenal to just keep your saws and all, everything nice and true. Okay, there's just little, little things that you do. We sand the bottom of the, the rails. Put a little bit of a radius on them here. Because again, dust builds up. It just takes a little bit of, with the scraper, putting a little camphor on there, and then hitting it with the sandpaper. Okay, for this to run nice and smooth on the face.